Welcome, dear readers. You are listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. Uh, We are here recording in the lovely Carol Shields Auditorium in the magnificent Millennium Library here in Treaty 1 territory and on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are excited that you're able to join us for the first of what will hopefully be many episodes. Today we will be discussing Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. I'm Alan, I'm the librarian at Transcona Library, and to my right is... Hi, I'm Kirsten, and I'm your librarian at the West End Library, and right next to me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, and I'm the librarian at the Louis Riel Library, and across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Erica. I'm the librarian at the Fort Gary Library. A good book can carry me away from an ever-engined ordinary day. Yeah. So keep it down, leave me alone. Close the doors and turn off the phone. Cause all I ever really need is a little more time to read. Of course, we couldn't do this without you, dear readers. And since this book club is a little more long distance than most, we want you to start off our discussions. So email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. Remember, only you can determine whether we laugh or cry. (laughs) So each month, be sure you find time to read the selected book because there will be spoilers. Send your questions, thoughts, and comments anytime to wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or find us on social media, and we'll incorporate your comments on the air. Make sure you stick around to the end for a special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. And one last thing, if you haven't read Oryx and Craig by Margaret Atwood, now is your last chance to press the pause button, because Kirsten is going to give a brief author bio, followed by Erica, who is going to spoil everything (laughs) with a brief synopsis. (laughs) All right. So, Margaret Atwood, very much an icon of Canadian literature, but here's a brief bio. Margaret Atwood was born in 1939 in Ottawa, Ontario. She comes from a family of scientists. Her mother was a former nutritionist, and her father was an entomologist who ran a forest insect research station in northern Quebec, where Atwood and her siblings spent much of their early formative years. Her brother Harold is said to have taught Atwood to read and to canoe. He would eventually become a professor of physiology and zoology. Margaret Atwood is, of course, a very prolific writer. She's an author of over 40 works, including poetry, fiction, short stories, speculative fiction, children's picture books, radio scripts, graphic novels, essays, and tweets. She also has penned satiric cartoons under the pseudonym Bart Gerard. She's the inventor of the long pen, a remote signing device that allows a person to remotely write in ink anywhere in the world via tablet, the internet, and a robotic hand. She helped found the Canadian English-speaking chapter of Penn International, is honorary president of the Rare Bird Club, and with her novel Scribbler Moon, is the first contributor to the Future Library Project, which is a public artwork aiming to collect an original work by a popular writer every year from 2014 to 2114 and to share those works with the world only then, in the year 2114. Margaret Atwood has won multiple awards and holds honorary degrees from 16 different educational institutions. Her novel, Oryx and Crate, was published in 2003 and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Giller. Yay! Yay, Margaret Atwood! Yay, Margaret Atwood! All right, Mm -hmm. so the summary for Oryx and Crate. It's an America of the near future, and Snowman, self-styled after the abominable Snowman, seems to be the only human left besides the near-human herbivores he calls Krakers. Only he remembers life before, where genetic engineering of humans, animals, and plants was common, art only existed to be used as propaganda, and every bit of the human experience from conception to death was big business. So Snowman invents an origin for the Krakers, a story of who they are and how they came to be, but as readers, we see a very different one. The story of Snowman and Crake, aka Jimmy and Glenn, and the lover of them both, the enigmatic Oryx. So here comes the real spoiler. We slowly learn that Snowman's friend, Crake, a brilliant bioengineer, 
has decided to take it upon himself to save the planet and any vestiges of humankind he can. After creating the Krakers, he distributes a terrible disease that wipes out all other humans. His last act is to kill Oryx. So Snowman is left alone trying to survive in this new world, tortured by memories of what was and what might have been, and of Oryx and Crake. Way to spoil it. Excellent. <laughs> it's thoroughly spoiled. Good now. job. <clears throat> so before we dive into the deep uh, depths of this, this book, um, <laughs> Margaret Atwood, I, I feel like has permeated, permeated the consciousness of like all Canadians. Like I feel like I knew about her bef- practically before I could read. Um, so <laughs> does anyone else have any experiences uh, with Margaret Atwood uh, that affect how, how you came into this novel? Well, for me, um, uh, Margaret Atwood has been kind of a literary blind spot for me. I've, I've never uh, read her before, so I was super excited when we picked Oryx and Crake, because now this is my chance to, to read her. And in fact, my only kind of experience with her was seeing a, the Red Band trailer for the original 1990 movie version of The Handmaid's Tale in a movie theater. And uh, I only remember some really questionable sex scenes involving <laughs> Robert Duvall. And, and that really stuck with me over the years. And uh, oh I, was, I, was a, I was a teenager. I, I don't know what I was doing in a theater. They were showing a Red Band uh, <laughs> trailer, the, the head stuff. But that's, that's my experience with Margaret Atwood. I mean, I've been a fan of Margaret Atwood since the 80s, probably when my mom gave me uh, The Cat's I, um, 1988 or something like that, and I, I went to hear Margaret Atwood do a reading from this novel, and I loved the novel. I uh, I, I found the, the story very engrossing, engaging. I liked her, really liked her writing style. I liked how confident she writes, how smart she is, and how complex the stories are. And I also really like her deadpan voice. I don't know, that just, <laughs> that, that really got to me. I, so then I read lots of other of her books, love the female protagonists, always so complex, complicated, flawed. So you, you could say I'm a fan. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I just, I have to say that just in the last year, with, uh, you know, in, in the whole sort of um, climate of hashtag me too, um, and what's been going on in the Canlit community, some of my uh, feelings have um, have become conflicted. Uh, I've I felt very conflicted about uh, some of the responses that I hear from the Canlit community, including Margaret Atwood, and in a conversation that I feel hasn't been has been almost more hurtful than helpful. So I sat down to read this novel, which I hadn't read before. Um, and I wondered, hmm, how am I going to approach this? How? I mean, I'm a fan of hers, but how, I'm feeling so conflicted about this, uh, about her right now. So that also then brings to mind a larger question, too, about when authors, artists uh, do things, say things um, that aren't, that, that you don't agree with politically, philosophically, emotionally. How does it affect or does it affect your approach to their work? Do you, does it affect how much you like it or not? Um, and I just want to say, uh, just to wind this up, that I found it didn't affect my reading of Oryx and Craig, I have to say. Um, I still am a fan of this book, and I still think that Margaret Atwood is a, is a really great writer. That's yes. a deep personal That's history right. story. That was like going right. down there. I know, I love that. I'd say that was the sound yeah. of a can of worms being a <laughs> yeah. Well, I think maybe as much as I try not to have things like that influence my reading, um, it does. I guess I'm an emotional reader. Now, this specific book, I had, I, I kind of went, I had a roller coaster ride with because um, things I found out about her and then other things I found out about her that made me understand the book a little bit better. So for me, my back background with, with Margaret Atwood is that I read The Handmaid's Tale first a long time ago. Me too. And I think that if... I saw the trailer, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that maybe that th- this might have been a better one for a young person to read than Handmaid's Tale um, in terms of relatability and content and things to think about. But what really did it for me in terms of making me not necessarily predisposed is there was something in the preface of The Handmaid's Tale where she was arguing very strongly that it wasn't science fiction, that it was speculative fiction. And that just sort of struck me as an odd thing because the science fiction community was very vocal in their support of her 
that it seemed sort of odd that she was trying to distance herself from them. So that sort of just kind of I put me off a little bit. But in terms of this one, I actually really I really enjoyed reading this book. I thought that it was like just dense with things to sink your teeth into. And um, one thing that helped me enjoy it more was finding was finding out about her upbringing in a scientist family. Mm-hmm. And so I could see why her mind would be predisposed to more of a intellectual gymnastics sort of book than maybe the, the kind of touchy feely thing that <laughs> I like in my favorite books. So yeah, I have emotional responses. Well, and I, and I don't read science fiction, not as a rule, but as a rule. Um, so I think maybe the, the whole idea of speculative fiction is a little bit more accessible to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, so. It's interesting because that term speculative fiction, uh, it can mean different things to different people. Like I've yeah. always thought of it as like an umbrella term that uh, encompasses science fiction and fantasy and uh, time travel stories and monster stories and horror and uh, alternative oh. realities. Like, whereas I don't know if Margaret Atwood means it that way, or is it, is it like a like uh, like science fiction for people who you know uh, read literature? Or well, I mean, that's I know, right. Know, that like, would I, be like, me. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I like think not it's, not genre. I, yes, I think it's, and I haven't gone. I should have gone out and, and plotted the timelines on this, but I think. Back in the day, for Margaret Atwood, science fiction was really like like the space opera, like a like yeah. Star Wars, like yeah. um, what yeah, was that that Flash Gordon? And, yeah. That and that really like it takes place in space and science is involved, but it's not like influenced by real science. Um, so then, things that are inter- inf- Ironically, things that are influenced by real science then are not science fiction. They're speculative because right. they do have that reality. And I think maybe at some point along the line, science fiction, you know, came to encompass, you know, a more science-based... Um, it became broader in its definition. Exactly, maybe yes. When, yeah. And I read something about her recently where she said science fiction is about now. Well... One of the things that she said, I think specifically about this book, is that um, she doesn't categorize it as science fiction because it doesn't deal with things we can't yet do or begin to do. Mm. Whereas for me, I, maybe I've always had a broad idea of what science fiction is. And if it's if it's a fiction in the near future where there's science things that we can't mm. that we mm. like that's different than now, then I think of it as science fiction if it's right. based around science. Yeah, but. Mm. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing too is I think this like fits in like the subcategory of science fiction of of um, post apocalyptic fiction, yeah. which I think is is totally science fiction, um, but it really is a scenario when human progress actually stops instead of is going forward, which I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. But what you said, Kirsten, about science fiction dealing with the now, I think it's true. I think every science fiction book that's written is a commentary on the world when it's written. Like when you think back to like Ray Bradbury's stories in the 40s and 50s, he was commenting on America and uh, the Cold War by using Martians as, mm-hmm. as, a, as the a surrogate for that. And when this was written in the early 2000s, um, there's one part where uh, Jimmy pretty much gets a job as a as a uh, weeder yeah, at, yeah. His school. in a library and, and, and the, yeah. there's this whole idea of getting rid of the paper books and uh, and introducing uh, CD-ROMs mm-hmm. that we don't really talk about CD-ROMs <laughs> now no, no. but, but, but at that time when she was writing it that was the future and it made me think a little bit last fall I saw the sequel to uh, Blade Runner uh, Blade Runner uh, 2049 and in the original Blade Runner movie which came out in 1982 one part of the um, art department's thing was huge billboards, uh, neon billboards that had companies that were big then. So you had like huge billboards for Pan Am or huge billboards for Atari. <laughs> and the cool thing with uh, Blade Runner 2049 is they just went with that. And so even though it's 20 years there, in this movie, I saw a huge Atari. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, you know, because in that world, that's an alternate reality. Yeah. And maybe then, you know, it's Atari is still huge. You know, maybe Pan Am is still a thing. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's, well, that's I, I really wish that that and the post-apocalyptic thing is why I really wish I'd read this 10 plus years ago. Because since then, every book 
is in a post-apocalyptic yeah. book. Mm-hmm. And there's so there were so many things in there that I'm like, oh, you know, we've seen this is her take on this. I'm like, but no, but she, but this was 2003. Yeah, like, right. and and especially the CD-ROM thing really reminded me of that. And actually, I was I was trying to find an idea of what she actually kind of predicted in this book that maybe I don't. Like, the same way on Star Trek, they all have tablets, and it was cool. Like, it was a new, weird thing then, and now you're like, okay, they all have tablets. It's not it's not futuristic anymore. I had found this uh, an article talking about some of the ways, things that she predicted in the book, especially in terms of technology. So the important role of, and a lot of it had to do with the boys in their teenage years and the way they would occupy themselves. So right. there was... Um, the important role of online video games, much or, yeah, and, and and things like watching videos like on YouTube now, um, the ubiquity of pornography in the dark web, how Jimmy first sees Oryx in a, in a child porn, biotechnologies that are casually mentioned in the novel, uh, which were pretty much impossible in 2003, but now there's all kinds of genetic manipulation and chicky knobs. <laughs> and in, and in, in, oh. in vitro meat, which is a thing now, yeah. uh, cross species splicing, all of these things. So I found a tweet the other day that was talking about the upcoming Super Bowl, where um, the Eagles and the Patriots are going to be playing. And the last time they met was in 2005. And this tweet was talking about all the things that didn't exist in 2005. It's just really amazing. I mean, look at this the iPhone, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, iPads. BuzzFeed, Spotify, Uber, Alexa, Airbnb, Bitcoin, Pinterest, Google Maps, Kindle, and Fitbit. And if you go back, yeah, if you go back a year before, you could include uh, Facebook as well. It's not existing at the time that Margaret would publish this book. I can't believe Google Maps. I, like, that I was feel, say, how do you live without Google Maps? Yeah, I feel like I would just not be in this room right now. <laughs> You'd be lost. I think the most terrifying thing, and, and this is like really recent, is is the whole altering video and yeah. audio, which is is now like of a very high quality that you could swap someone's face and swap someone's voice as long as you have a big enough sample of a recording of them. And who doesn't have like samples of video and recordings of people's mm. voices these days, especially if you're famous. Or and, on a podcast. Or on a podcast, yeah, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I think it's like especially terrifying in light of um, the fact of, of fake news these days. And, yeah. and mm-hmm. I've been like looking into... Um, these video face manipulations and these are freeware programs that people can learn in like five hours and you can swap someone's face off and so what's that going to do for for videos online and so you really have to pay attention to the authority of of what your sources are you know look Mm -hmm. at those domain names like is it a is it (laughs) harvard.edu or i see a rule here for librarians (laughs) (laughs) visit your local library if you're confused or worried about it information information. your source source. that's right and that reminds me to say if i say anything that's even remotely questionable today it's because uh the audio has been altered (laughs) (laughs) i i think you know, I think something we should uh, ask of our audience, uh, since we are like four librarians mm. sitting around a table, like if we make like a factual error, Send let it. us know. <laughs> Call us out on it. Uh, we, except for maybe Trevor, don't don't have have. Uh, we don't mind being. <laughs> we we will fess up if you, know, you right. can correct things us. Things are way easier before Google. You can yeah. just say something. It's like, well, I guess that's the way it is. <laughs> Did you know that the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling has been challenged repeatedly in classrooms and libraries around the world because of its depiction of wizardry and magic? Or what about the children's book and Tango Makes Three, which in some American school libraries has been placed in a restricted area of the library and children require parental permission to check it out? These challenges to books and stories and thought is why we celebrate Freedom to Read Week annually to encourage Canadians to think about and reaffirm their commitment to intellectual freedom. 
which is guaranteed to us under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This year, you can celebrate Freedom to Read from February 25th through March 3rd at your local branch of the Winnipeg Public Library. Watch for displays of banned and challenged books, learn more about intellectual freedom, and celebrate freedom of expression. Be sure to drop by the West End Library anytime during the week and get your photo taken for our mugshot wall. Get caught reading a banned or challenged book and support our freedom to read. So, uh, maybe, speaking of listeners, this would be a good time uh, to bring in some listeners uh, Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe take a little bit of a lighter uh, look at this book. Um, We had, um, they had funny, funny little, little creatures called rat hunks in the book. Does someone want to explain what a rat hunk is? Well, I mean, uh, a lot of these uh, future cyclical animals have been genetically spliced together. So a hunk is a skunk with all of its smelly parts removed, <laughs> and a raccoon with all of his uh, aggressive parts removed. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes a perfect pet. I, I like how you say, like, parts. Like, these are, like, physical ass <laughs> Look, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not sure how they did it, but uh, apparently they're adorable. Uh, and they make good pets. So what, Am when I close? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. I think that's it. What, one of the things that we asked on, on Facebook and, and social media was if you had a pet rat hunk like Jimmy, and Jimmy's uh, rat hunk was named uh, Killer. Killer. Yeah. Um, what would you name it? Um, so Aaron from Facebook uh, said uh, Danger or Ranger or Stranger. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she has three. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Danielle from Facebook said Remy. Hmm. Remy the rat Our Our names. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Yeah. 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 Do we have any non R names around the table? I I had one. Mm-hmm. Mine was Stinky Face <laughs> because I think it's funny if something's been destinkified to name it Stinky Face, and also because there's a book, kids book called I Love You Stinky Face, where the kid is asking its mom, "Will you still love me if I'm a smelly skunk? If I'm a crocodile with sharp teeth?" And so there's a really cute picture of the kid with a, as a skunk. So, does do you feel like a parallel to to Jimmy in that sense? Because Jimmy like kind of <laughs> took the opposite creature, and he was like uh, gonna name it Bandit, if you remember. <laughs> That's uh, right. And then you know his mom was like, "What are you gonna name it? Like Bandit?" He's like, "No killer." <laughs> See, I thought I thought you were gonna ask is because 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 Jimmy's mother left. Yeah. And so she didn't love him unconditionally like this kid in the book. No. That's where I thought you were going. Uh, with no, no, this no. Question. But but she he, loved he, him so much that she was willing to take his pet with her. Well, and go and do the right thing and fight for the world. That's oh, right. In the same way that Craig loved Ork so much, he killed, her, <laughs> he killed her in the end. Is that the idea, Kristen? Is that what we're, is that what we're hearing? We cannot we cannot uh, equate Craig and Jimmy's mother in the same in the same uh, okay. space. I, no. I never she I never the thought of, of that I never thought of his mom that way. That he loved, she loved him so much. She was so worried about the world. She was going to go out there and fight for it and fight against the evil corporations and 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 the evil turn that science is is doing. And so she's like, "I'm sorry, Jimmy. I'm going to have to sacrifice you." Not that yeah. that's my mothering. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac, it's okay. <laughs> Isaac seems fine. <laughs> but wouldn't I mean? Oh man, I feel like I'd be selfish. I feel like I'd be like, I. I would want my mom. <laughs> yes, of course. I guess I maybe that's mom. because my I guess my dad oh, okay. buzzed off. <laughs> but, but oh dear, this moment. Is, this is a pretty personal. Yeah, because I'm sorry. Now I've like totally now moved on to Jimmy's mother away yeah. from the raccoons. I, I still no, have a raccoon. I'm maybe. sorry. Okay. <laughs> right. So I would name it if I had one. And he used to say, yeah. I don't have one. Uh, I would call him... Yeah, uh, hearing your science, <laughs> scientific um, description of it, I'm sure so you know exactly how to do yeah, it. Yeah, uh, so I would have called him Billy. And the reason I call him Billy is because in the Stephen King series, The Dark Tower, there's a creature called a Billy Bumbler. Uh-huh. And he... I took a, I know this is a podcast, so this isn't a digital medium, but I printed out a picture of him. <laughs> I'm showing oh, him right now. Yeah. And so he looks like a cross between wow. a raccoon, a woodchuck, and a dachshund. And, and he's stripy. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and this particular one's name is Oi, because he couldn't 
pronounce first syllables, so he tried to say boy. Um, no, he's saying oi, and so he he's he's a major character in the series. So okay. that's where it's that's really cute. So we can tweet that and Instagram that. Of course, yeah. After. Well, I, I, I yes, I took this from a, a Dark Tower wiki, and the funny thing about it is all the comments are like, "That's not what Billy Bumber looks like," <laughs> and then a link to like another animal. So it, which which made me think that that fiction is a collaborative process between the author and the reader. Right, the mm. author is only one part of it. Uh, he or she writes the book, but us readers, we all have different ideas of what these characters look like. So I thought this was a nice little sort of study as to you know what, how we imagine them. And because yeah. I didn't really, I thought he looked more like a kind of like a ferret, uh, <laughs> a rac- you know. I know it's a half raccoon, right? But that's how I had the picture in my and that's head. That's why, like how like TV and video adaptations are always controversial yes. for fans of the original book because you have your very personal way of picturing things. And then somebody does something you disagree, and that's yeah. not at all how he's supposed that's to look. That's not how Hogwarts yeah. was supposed to look. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. Or does look in exactly. the reality of my mind. Exactly. So I, did you say your raccoon name? I did didn't, because, you, you know, like, I, I'm not so... Uh, I have a name, Dave. Because <laughs> the only animal pet that I've ever felt any connection with was my dog Dave. Aww. And so if I was ever to have a raccoon and have like a connection with it, I would probably call it Dave. <laughs> Dave was like the best dog, emotional genius. Everybody Aww. loved him. He loved me. I loved him. Yeah. So, so every Dave pet you ever have in the will be named will Dave. Be named if Dave. I ever have another pet. <laughs> ever. He'll never be I don't know. They'll just, the they'll never be. Yeah. So, I mean, if I had to choose. The OG I, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we miss you, Dave. <laughs> Dave, heart, heart Dave, one point oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's sweet, though. Did right. you? Off the top of my head, Ed. 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 That's a good okay, name. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> These are all people names, Billy. Really. Yeah, yeah. Ratcunks are people, too. Not mm. to me. Not mm. stinky face. Not <laughs> stinky face. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have a, we got another um, question, and this one's a little bit more substantial uh, from a listener out there. Um, so, uh, Catherine from um, what was her library? Her library, Windsor Park. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Windsor Park Library. <laughs> um, she asks if we learned anything from the characters. Um, did you learn anything from? From Snowman, or from Oryx, or from Craig. Oh my goodness. Snowman taught us that when something traumatic happens, you get drunk, <laughs> and you pass out in a tree until you feel better. No? That's not the lesson? I had trust issues with Craig and Oryx. I, yeah. I, don't think I, I learned to maybe not take them at face value, which maybe... Yeah. Like, no. Both of them together? Well, separately and together. Uh, for different reasons, maybe, but uh, we can get into. But yeah, I never quite thought, knew if I was getting the straight story from those guys. Oh, you never were getting the straight story. Well, from thank them. you for confirming my <laughs> <laughs> paranoia. Yeah, no, totally. Like, so, but then, do you think um, Jimmy slash Snowman is a reliable narrator? No. <laughs> I was cl- I was clinging to Jimmy. I, I wanted to believe him. Well, because he was the only person that we were hearing anything from, really. Right. But also, I mean, anybody that tells a story is not a reliable narrator. I mean, every time I tell a story, a family story, uh, something that I've heard somebody else tell, I I often embellish, I misremember, and I think mm-hmm. that happens all the time. I don't think we uh, can have a narrator ever be completely truthful and. And Me, reliable. I tell the truth all the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. and you have a perfect memory. A perfect memory. Except when it comes from to, to what Catherine's library was. <laughs> yes. That's the only time your memories ever stopped. Working. That is the first failure. Uh, I'm sad to say that it happened <laughs> on, while air. I, on air. <laughs> I, I, I think. Uh, I, I think also the other two characters just weren't developed enough. Um, I mean, we have Snowman. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, that's mm-hmm. the only fully developed character, and that's what sort of annoyed me was that Oryx wasn't was such an underdeveloped character, and perhaps mm-hmm. on purpose though, because I feel like whenever Jimmy was asking her, she would deny a thing, and then she and then she tells a story, and I, I never trusted whether the whether she was telling Jimmy what he wanted to hear 
Or, you know what I mean? Maybe like, that was her coping. I think, I think so. I, I think that was, yeah. But because right. on page Enigma. 191, she says, she ref- she says it said, uh, she refused to feel what he wanted her to feel. She was, she wasn't victim. She was, you know. She uh, seemed to have some agency yeah. over her life. Yeah. So yeah. would you, do you, so we have to make a lot of assumptions about Oryx that she is the person from the videos that Jimmy saw. Do do we think that she actually is the person or do you think she's some, some creation that uh, Craig found to to trick Jimmy and they were in collusion together. I just, I just didn't believe that story that he got her through student services. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, if that's really... I mean, is that it's just, speculative uh, fiction. <laughs> that part to me feels like a story that Craig made up. Like, that's the oh, one example like, like, that it's too... Because he was using her as the portal to, into the Mad Adam... Was it through the Mad Adam website? It was her face and her eye. Remember? Oh, right. And, and then, yeah. and then she was like, "Hey, that's the that that's that same." Or, or no, it was Craig that said, "You recognize?" I think. Yeah. And so, so there's. And Jimmy pretended not to. Yes, yes. And he did, and that was way before Jimmy knew that Orx was a real person who was eventually going to come and work at Paradise. So, yeah. But perhaps it was also just that was. How Craig and, um, or Glenn and Jimmy. Glenn. His tone say it all. Approached women, you know? One woman looks the same as the other, um, and and um, and then she's underdeveloped as a character because it didn't really matter. It's, I think the vagueness was something to do with that. I think it was sort of to be it doesn't really matter if she's the same girl that's in these these mm-hmm. movies and been exploited in all these ways because lots of girls were mm-hmm. in these movies and exploited in all these in all these ways and does it really matter whether it was her or somebody else in the long run and, and that's, so that's why she, she never she, she yeah she never she never kind of came out and said yeah that was me that wasn't me because it doesn't matter if mm-hmm. it wasn't if it doesn't matter because it's either good or or bad or it happened or it didn't happen mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know does that make any sense? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, s- speaking of Glenn. Glenn. <laughs> so, Glenn with the two N's. Glenn and n- Named after just, a dead pianist. Oh, that's right. Oh. I was going to say also, I'm, for the record, uh, Aaron, who wrote in, is Aaron with two N's. Just oh, to, okay. Oh, just oh, to make Aaron, that Aaron after a dead pianist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pianist with two hands. So, I read this. I read this interview with uh, Margaret Atwood, where because yeah, she named it, um, Glenn Craig after Glenn Gould, the Canadian um, uh, pianist, and she said that years after she had written Oryx and Craig, um, she learned that Glenn Gould, when he was ten years old, had written an opera where all the people died in the end and only animals survived. No. Come on. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's crazy. Uh-huh. So bum, you want to uh-huh. hear another Glenn connection? Yes. <laughs> uh, so there's a video game called Chrono Trigger uh, in which uh, there's a character whose name is Glenn, um, but you only find that out in flashbacks because he is known as Frog throughout. Uh, so he's also known as an animal uh, mm. like Craig is. Um, but in this case, it's because he's literally been turned into a frog. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about animal names now, then? Yes. What so, do you, well, you want to talk about I, them? I wanted to know if you had to choose an extinctathon name, what would it be? Dave. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> Poor Dave. I, Dave again. I know. Like, I guess. <laughs> um, but, but. I feel like we're going to get a lot of... Uh, uh, email letters in saying that there are still Daves that exist <laughs> in the world. And dogs. <laughs> he was the only I'm, one of his species. I'm going to try and just bring Dave into every podcast. I'm just warning you now. Um, I would want to be uh, Dave, though, to be uh, um, a monarch butterfly. Because the Latin name for monarch butterfly is sleepy transformation, which was the complete opposite oh. of what Dave was. <laughs> was not sleepy at all. So you, so this would be an ironic. Yes. <laughs> like stinky face. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So anyway, that's that's good. 
Well, and I, I, I took your advice, Erica, and rather than take an extinct name, which is sad, I, I looked up and the extinct animals, were, the list was so long I got depressed, I took an endangered name, which is a little more hopeful. So I took the Olive Ridley Sea tur- Turtle. <laughs> I, I took a sea turtle because turtles are slow, and I'm a slow reader. <laughs> And all of Ridley already sounds like a name. Oh, so I think I just go with Ridley. Right. Ridley's good. Ridley yeah. will be my good. Yeah. extinct. I, I oh, could okay. make another uh, video game reference, but I won't. <laughs> Rain it in. Rain it in. <laughs> so um, my, I'm, I'm going to do you one better, Trevor. <laughs> Please do. So instead of going from uh, extinct to, um, to near extinct, uh, my name will be... Uh, something that is extinct that I really, really, really want science to bring back, uh, and that's mammoth. And you keep <laughs> hearing all these like scientists can take frozen mammoth DNA and uh, and uh, carry it carry it to term in a in an elephant, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, that would be that fingers would be crossed. Exciting nice. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I had a similar one because I. I, I totally disregarded my own advice about looking for an endangered species <laughs> name because I remembered the giant ground sloth that oh. lived in the Americas and it's now been long extinct. So it was it, so the, the name would be Megatherium, um, and they were sloths that were about the size of an elephant. And I thought, and so they were so big that they couldn't climb trees. They would just stand up on their hind legs, bounce on their tail, and pull down the tree branches <laughs> and eat, and then like go to sleep in a cave. And I'm, this 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 is pretty much the coolest animal that I've ever <laughs> heard of. So that would be my Megatherium. Probably yep. pretty cool Rolls caves up the too. Pretty cool <laughs> caves. So we just need to create usernames and passwords now, and now we're in. We're into the mainframe. <laughs> Public Library, how can I help you? Oh, hi, yeah, I'm wondering do you, if you have a repair manual for a 1974 Fiat 128. Uh, just a moment while I check. Yes, it looks like we have one, but it's checked out at the moment. Oh, shoot, my brother-in-law is working on my car right now. He was supposed to be changing the spark plugs for me, but now he's messing around with a voltage regulator or something. I'd feel a lot better if we had instructions and diagrams right now. The library does offer access to Chilton's auto repair database through our website. Would you like me to help you access that? Sure. Go to winnipeg.ca slash library and click on the databases button. Scroll down until you see Chilton's auto repair and click on the link. Enter your library card information. Once you're in, you can select the year, make, and model of your car. You'll find maintenance tables, repair instructions, diagrams, and more. Fantastic. I'll get it up on our iPad so my brother-in-law can have a look. Oh, uh, too late. Something's on fire. It's okay. Would you like me to look up the number of a tow truck company for you? Could you? Hi, this is Jennifer Still, author of the poetry collection, Comma. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. Can we talk about words? And words, sure. like yeah. the power yes, of yes, words yes. in There's this a... book and all the lists. And... Yes, yes, we can. Go yeah. to town. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, just that, that Jimmy was a word surf, I guess, is mm-hmm. what they... Um, and was researching all these old, old words and mm-hmm. then making up new words um, and then got this job as an ad person to make all of these scientific experiments credible with all of these made up words that he had. Um, but then when he's sitting on the tree after the end of the world um, and he just keeps repeating words to himself and the, these lists of words and how words for him are hope. Um, and he almost like holds on to the memory of words almost as much as he holds on to memories of people in his life. And I just found that really impactful. I, yeah, and I think, what if you were to look at that from an outsider's perspective? Like, because if, you know, sometimes you see people who are, who, who do repeat words and, and, you know, it's a sign that, you know, um, something isn't quite, quite right and that they, they need help. So, um, you know, so you have this great, great thought of what Jimmy's like on the inside. What do you think that that, how do you think he would be viewed from someone other than, you know, 
some other survivor. Well, I mean, he was viewed by, okay, maybe not other survivors, but by, viewed by the Quakers as then being this, you know, prophet, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. he had all these words to share. <laughs> and then they, that actually made them curious and chaos. What, what is that word? What does that mean? And, and so he was then able, you know, to share. Yeah, and I people. feel like that, may, that makes it even sadder because what the Quakers <laughs> didn't, didn't have any other choice. They didn't I know. know any better. Well, they yeah. were simple. They didn't, the, the, simple in yeah. terms of their language yeah. because yeah. that would make their life easier. Just wait till year 30 rolls around for those creatures. It's not going to be a nice, a good year for them. <laughs> the, the thing that I thought was interesting about the words was, was so, I feel like there was like kind of a dichotomy between the old words and the new words and that Jimmy would have all the lists of the old words and Margaret Atwood would create these like portmanteaus mm -hmm. of, of new words to, to create brand names like um, Bliss Puss and mm -hmm. um, Rejuvene Reju or, yeah. <laughs> Rejuvenescence. Rejuvenescence. Yeah. What was yeah. the coffee-ish one? Oh, uh, Happy Cuppa. Happy Cuppa. And, and that one I had forgotten about. <laughs> yeah. I rediscovered it last night. I loved it because it's a tiny little section of the book, which doesn't really... Uh, it's a kind of almost a throwaway company, but I feel like it encapsulates the character of Jimmy and Craig, like in a nutshell, because there's this scene. Well, for those who don't remember, Happy Cuppa is this uh, corporation that's developed a coffee bean that matures at the exact same time of year, so that uh, rather than have to hand pick the coffee, they can just go in with huge mechanical harvesters, and then boom, it's a, it's efficient, it's done, but it's put all the little coffee makers out of business, and this one giant corporation. So people are uh, revolting uh, uh, over this, and so they they stage a like a Boston Tea Party uh, event, a, a Boston coffee party. Jimmy, Jimmy's mother, <laughs> Jimmy, yes, being one exactly. of them. Uh, yes, and, and and so they throw all these huge crates of um, of uh, coffee in the harbor, uh, but they float. <laughs> and, 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 and it's almost like a, a happy cup of ad because he's there floating there. And so, and Jimmy's response because he's the like the wordsmith and he's the feeler and he's why I feel like the human. He's he gets thirsty. And Craig, all he says is those idiots. They forgot to put rocks in the the boxes. So so he's like he doesn't think about the the wider issue, the social issues. He just he's like the the mechanic of can this be done and how can it be done better. Solve so, this problem. Yeah, like he thinks more like to quote Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park. You know, he spent so much time thinking whether they could. He yeah. didn't spend enough time thinking about whether they should. Mm. Yeah. Well, so that's isn't that paragraph. all Craig all yeah. the way? Yeah. 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 Yes. So yeah. again, and that's just one little like like three paragraphs out of the novel. And it really struck me how, like, densely, I don't mean dense in a negative way, but dense is in, like, layered, layered this novel yeah. is yeah. You know, with, with these little moments that kind yeah. of, you sprinkle these character moments throughout the whole book. Makes it an excellent book club book. Mm -hmm. Also made it an excellent choice for our first, our first podcast because of all the, the, the news around the Handmaid's Tale TV show, and now the, this one is Oryx and Crake, and the, the following two in the trilogy are being made into mm -hmm. a TV show, so... Yeah, Margaret Edwards in the news. We have to thank our, our, many reasons. our producer for that one. Uh, <laughs> yes. Finding that news for us. He's given us the thumbs He's up. He's given us the thumbs up. <laughs> On the other side of the invisible glass. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I am so excited that there is there is um, that there's gonna be a, a TV show about this. Uh it's an I, excellent TV show. I didn't I didn't say this at the top of the show, and maybe I should have because that's when we were talking about it, but this is my favorite book of all time mm -hmm. uh, and this is Oryx and Crake Oryx and Crake is Whoa. wow yeah. well, it's nice of you to let us tear it apart <laughs> yeah. well, and dissect that. it because I would have been nervous if I didn't like it <laughs> yeah. but, but I did love yeah. it yeah so this was this, this was like my fourth time reading reading this <gasps> book <gasps> That's how you so, got the bogus. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, right, so we should talk about that because I have a theory from what oh. movie that's from. Okay. Because okay. he talks about the word bogus uh, and he talks about picking it up from from an old DVD that he watched. And do you guys have any idea what DVD? I just pictured Polly Shore. Bill uh, and Ted's Ex-Mortal. Yes. Was it really? Oh, yes. yes. I, or the second one, The Bogus Journey is the sequel. The yeah. Journey. I guess it's in the first one. Too. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's I, the... You're probably I just right. raised my arms. <laughs> in, in victory. Victory. I love Because I and never Ted. get movie references. Yeah. So, so because you mentioned Bill and Ted, does that mean we have to link to Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure in the library catalog? I I feel like we have to, and I, am gonna be, I don't know that we have it, but I will... Definitely make sure we order it if we go. <laughs> because one of it's so good. one of the things that I think is sad in life, oh. and this is this Getting is honestly, honestly, truly, Shoot. is that um, 
Keanu Reeves does not get enough respect as an actor. I agree. <laughs> I, I, I feel the same way about Keanu Reeves. So I'll like, give Keanu a little more love. How many, how many good movies does he have to be <laughs> in? Speaking about dogs dying, Kirsten should not see John Wick if she hasn't seen it yet. Oh. Spoilers. <laughs> that dog doesn't make it through the movie. Oh. Was he an emotional genius? The dog? Like, like yeah. Dave? Ah, he's not, that's not our own mind. That's cute. Yeah, then. <laughs> Spoilers on Spoilers. Darling, everybody. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But Speed is one of my favorite movies, just to go back to Keanu Reeves. Yeah, so. we can just uh, talk about Keanu. I think for we could probably. Let's get that spin off podcast <laughs> all about Keanu. Keanu time, you know. time to <clears throat> Keanu. He was great at uh, Point Break. <laughs> Point Break is excellent as well. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. Should we get back on? Yeah, yeah. Get back on track. Going, <laughs> but back on track, but going to spinoffs. Oh, okay. is, so uh, Trevor was talking about the the Hapa Kappa coffee mm-hmm. uh, and how they like cloned all the the beans and this this one bean strain took over. Um, do you know that's happening? And this really is sad. Uh, like the canneries thing was sad too. But bana- <laughs> <laughs> but bananas are going the way of, of the oh, dinosaur. Really? There's, like, the bananas that we eat in, in, in grocery stores, there's, like, they're basically clones of each other. Oh. And so the, the, the viruses and the plant diseases are, are slowly winning the war. Yeah. So what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to find a new, um, a new strain of banana that probably won't taste as good because apparently bananas are really hard to, to breed for Human consumption. Wow. Mm. Well, I, well, there's something I read, I think it was The Lost City of the Monkey God, where there's a section in there about banana republics and what they are and the, and the, the way that b- the banana plantations took over everything and like the economics of it in, c- cent- in South America. Um, and so I'm not surprised because it's a very, it's, it's a very artificial thing that's been going on and, and people's crazy consumptions mm-hmm. of banana. And yet I eat, I have a banana every day and I love a banana. So I hate the idea that I it's causing also, trouble. I share your affection when it comes to bananas. I I'm know. a banana a day or two. Nice. So we have to yeah. figure it out. Kirsten is strangely so. I just, <laughs> before, you, before, <laughs> before you say anything, I very, I very much distrust people who don't like bananas. <laughs> So, so go ahead. <laughs> how do you feel about bananas? <laughs> I've grown to like them. <laughs> <laughs> me, like me and olives. <laughs> no, not okay. olives for me. Okay. Well, what you, you, all this banana talk made me think of uh, a note I wrote down when I, re- when I was reading about whether this book is a cautionary tale or not. And my question was, can it be a cautionary tale if everything that she's cautioning us about is has already started is underway like is there is there a way back from oh, yeah. the road you know uh, sometimes i wonder about that have we are, are, what can we do as a society at this point so can we take a half step back on that and ask do we think that society as a whole is getting worse like do we feel that we are on that trajectory that i think Trevor's it seems about? like it's gotten worse since 2003 <laughs> More blood, less roses. (laughs) (laughs) I think like some of the things that she's talking about, people like are Mm -hmm. still doing, but I think there's also a larger group of people speaking out against it. Um, I think the green movement is bigger now Mm -hmm. and, and more people are getting politically involved again. So hopefully there are more people like Jimmy's mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good thing. That's more of a mainstream Mm -hmm. thing Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully. That don't have to leave their families and, and, take, their, and take their pets, their and their yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you want to 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 dive into the, to the deep facts of of and have empirical evidence of this, um, I'm going to recommend a book right now. Book recommendation. <laughs> Coming at uh, you. The the battle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm. I'm, 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 I'm Correct me if I'm wrong on the title, but I think it's The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, uh, who's a psychologist who um, just like took a deep dive in all of all of the data of society. And he measured things like murder rates, uh, crime rates, um, poverty rates. And if you look throughout all of the human history, um, we're on we're on a downward trend for for pretty much everything. So the, like humankind for human Down, human downward trend. Humankind, sorry, the bad humankind. things. The bad things the bad are things. the bad okay. things. Okay. Yes, okay. humankind. Humankind <laughs> is getting better. Okay. <laughs> right. So it's a downward trend in the number of bad things. Okay, it's yes. an upward trend in positivity. 
Yes. Okay. Yes. And actions, it's a good thing. Positive actions. Yeah. Okay. More roses, less blood. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If that helps you. Do you want to explain that reference for our listeners too? Maybe? Right. Well, yeah. there's a game that Craig and uh, Jimmy would play called Blood and Roses, where you would, the blood, uh, if I remember, was all the negative, horrible things that humanity has done. Uh, but then it's balanced by the roses, all of the wonderful things that humanity has created. And so you would make a list of uh, the, the, you know, the, the great art and, and the uh, science and uh, humanitarian um, things versus the wars and the, and the uh, violence and um, I think. Yeah, the thing that I liked about the game was that I, I believe it was balanced so that it was slightly easier to win on the blood side, but the negative effect of that is what if you won with the bloods, then society was destroyed. So, you know, you kind of had that you were left, I think Jimmy was left in with this bad feeling in his mouth of, if he won, mm. uh, because who wants to rule over a wasteland? Yeah, some people. <laughs> It seems like. You know, I wrote down this uh, this quote that I know has been going around on social media right now um, by Ursula Le Guin, mm -hmm. who just died, just of course. Yes. Um, and uh, I thought it actually spoke to, to some of what we're talking about right now in terms of uh, humankind and um, words and art and so uh, she wrote um, we live in capitalism its power seems escapable so did the d divine right of kings any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art the art of words Ooh. Um, so, so going back to Trevor's comment that uh, maybe this can be a cautionary tale mm -hmm. as something that we can... Uh, right, so let's not lose the words. words. Let's not <laughs> use the art of, of, of words, which yeah. I don't think we're in danger of doing. Once again, visit your local library. Right. <laughs> Some of the most popular programs WPL offers are our preschool story times. Each of our 20 locations hosts at least one weekly program for babies, toddlers, or preschoolers, and they are very often the very first ones to fill up. Whether it's the opportunity to get out and see other families from the neighborhood, or just the fun of the music and rhymes, it's great to see so many people recognizing the importance of early exposure to books, words, and songs. In addition to these regular preschool programs, we have lots of online resources for encouraging early literacy at home. Take a look at our Early Literacy Info Guide on winnipeg.ca slash library. It has sections on brain development, childhood milestones, recommended reads, and more. Click on Kids and Teens, and then Early Literacy, or find all of our info guides by clicking the Info Guides button right on the homepage. winnipeg.ca slash library. And after that uh, <laughs> wonderful plug, I think, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, it's time for our closing segment. Oh, yeah. Uh, nerd words what? for word nerds. Word, word, I think word, nerd, nerds, words, words. Okay. Nerd, words nerd words for word nerds. I okay. practiced that a lot. Okay. That was well. the one thing I didn't want to mess up on. I'm uh, going to always mess it up, just so <laughs> everyone knows. Just for fun. So this is the part of the show where each of our hosts pick a word, picks a word, since you see now I'm messing it up, <laughs> picks a word, defines it, and then explains why it has been tickling their tongues for the past month. Who wants to jump in here? Who's I'll, got a word? I'll start my very carefully selected word of sloth. One, because it was my extinct animal. Two, because it's what I like to be in the winter is, you know, <laughs> slothful. And secondly, or second, thirdly, um, because uh, the last time I was at the zoo, I saw the sloth there motoring around, <laughs> crawling as fast as I've ever seen a sloth move. That sounds and suspect. Eating. Yeah. And then <laughs> I heard that it passed away. So rest in peace, sloth. From the Winnipeg, um, I say the Boyne Park Zoo. Aww. That's what happens being exercised. I yeah, he was he was yeah, I guess so. Speaking of Too exercise, obviously speaking of My nerd word is choreomania. Ooh. So when I was reading this book, um, I was really uh, struck by the fact that not only science but capitalism and corporations were running amok. A muck um, in this book. Another good word. A muck. I like this word. But then thinking about the word a muck actually made me think of another word, 
choreomania or the dancing plague. Oh. Choreomania comes from the Greek chorus, meaning to dance, and mania, meaning madness. And choreomania occurred in mainland Europe between the 14th and 17th centuries and involved groups of men and women and children who just started dancing erratically, sometimes thousands at a time, dancing for hours, days, okay, months by some reports. Okay, you're, you look like you're not believing this, Trevor. But no, I'm just thinking like I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> well, no, they, eventually they collapsed from exhaustion or died. Yeah. Um, and musicians often accompanied the dancers to ward off the mania, but of course that totally backfired because <laughs> other people just started to join in. Um, possible reasons, stress-induced psychosis, starvation. There was lots of starvation at that time in ma- mainland Europe. Ingestion of ergot, a psychotropic mold found on mm-hmm. rye or an outbreak of mass hysteria. But whatever the reasons, choreomania stopped abruptly in about the mid-17th wow. century. Choreomania. Do you think that's weird. what the David Bowie song, Just Dance, is about? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a whole, like, do you think that's the inspiration for the, all those works of art, but the, the, what, the red shoes and the lady puts on the red shoes right. and she can't stop dancing? Right, right. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's something there. Because there is a story of, there's right. this one yeah. woman in Bruges, I think, who met, and that's in 1518 or something. The only way they got her to stop was she got hit by the, the trolley, I think, at the end. I think, oh, then yeah, it wasn't 1518. Be... <laughs> 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 All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, so, so Trevor, uh, yes. you have to segue into, into your... Well, speaking of, speaking, of, speaking of, I want to go back to the sloth idea. Mm-hmm. My word is Marmata Monax, mm-hmm. which is the uh, Linnaean binomial name for the common groundhog. Mm-hmm. And the reason I chose that is because all things going well, our podcast should be available to download on February 2nd, which is Groundhog Day. Shout out to Groundhog Day. (laughs) Also known as the pagan holiday in bulk, also the Christian feast day of Candlemas. And um, this animal, the groundhog, has been known as also by the red monk, the whistle pig, the woodchuck, and the land beaver. Wow. I'm not sure of that last one, but that's according to uh, my research. Um, this tradition began in Germany with a hedgehog. Were you aware of that, Kirsten? You're of German descent. I sure am. And uh, German immigrants brought the tradition to North America, but abandoned the hedgehog for the groundhog. It's unclear why. It's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> now, here in Winnipeg, awesome. we're pretty much bound to have six weeks more of winter anyway, right? So I don't think it really makes a big difference. But the most famous uh, Canadian uh, groundhog is uh, Wyerton Willie. Now, what they do is they let the thing live, and then when it dies, they announce it. And they have an understudy called Wee Willie that takes over. (laughs) And in 2006, uh, uh, Willie died like a couple days before Groundhog Day. So rather than have him do the predictions, they put him in a wee coffin, and they dressed him in a suit, and they put coins on his eyes, and they stuck a carrot in his hand. Uh, Uh. And then the the town uh, um, council got into trouble because, as it turned out, that wasn't the real uh, Willie. (laughs) They they, they, they locally sourced, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call that when you uh, stuff something? Taxidermy. It was a locally sourced taxidermy specimen. So, I have a lot more I could say about groundhogs. I really went down and the rabbit hole. And then choreomania broke yeah. out so I'm in not the streets. Gonna, I'm not going to say anything else. But, so uh, so I'm going I'm to pick up on carrot there then and, oh. and, and, and bring in bananas and, and talk about fruits and vegetables. And, and I have a little riddle for you guys because... Um, because you guys had such great words, and mine is rather simple. Uh, but it's the round fruit of a tree of the rose family, which typically has thin red or green skin and crisp flesh. Many varieties have been developed as a dessert or cooking fruit or for making cider. Apple. You got it. <laughs> and the reason I picked the apple... <laughs> That was clever. Really, really hard. <laughs> You're the one to not overthink it. Uh, the reason Cider. I picked Apple is uh, back when I was in high school, I was like really obsessed with the, this movie called Waking Life, uh, which is oh, okay. basically all about uh, this person who um, is in, in a dream state uh, and recognizes that he's in a dream state uh, so he can, you know, have some control over his dreams. And I thought that was so cool because I very often don't even remember my dreams let alone have dreams. Uh, so I like tried for like months and months uh, to to have a have a waking dream. And I, I once once in my life I, I was able to do it. I was in my high school and I realized I was there and I was like, oh my God, I can do anything. 
And then I couldn't think of anything I had to do. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm going to conjure an apple out of thin air. And so I tried really hard and I couldn't do it. And I was like, this is really disappointing. <laughs> and then I woke up Whoa. and there's a second half to this story. So I actually saw Margaret Atwood. Um, she was in Winnipeg. I think it was like 2007, 2008, somewhere in there for a thin air event. Um, and so I went with my mom and we decided to get books signed afterwards. So we were, um, lined up, we were at the back of the line and this lady comes around with post-it notes, uh, to write what you want Margaret Atwood to sign in your book. And she hands out all the post-it notes and I'm, I'm, I am not one to get autographs. Uh, I've since learned that apparently this is a thing, but I'm sitting there with this post-it note and they're like, write what you want Margaret Atwood to write. And I'm like one of the most powerful literary uh, <laughs> Canadian literary titans and I can get her to write anything <laughs> what do I do <laughs> and uh, so of course I, I couldn't think of anything uh, I think you're supposed to write your name <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I wrote apple on on the, on the on the sticky note so I go up to Margaret Atwood and I hand her the sticky note and she looks up to me and she's like Apple, and I'm like, uh -huh. I'm nodding my head for those people listening, and she's like, that's the name, and I'm like, again, just nodding, and so she signs it, uh, for Apple, best wishes, Margaret Atwood, oh. so oh for those voice. of you at home, I have the book here in front of me, uh, what's in the copy, of? it's a copy of Life Before Man, mm -hmm. uh, so we'll take a picture of the signature, and we're gonna, we're gonna treat it at, uh, tweet it out, uh, and put it on Instagram, and, uh, and our, show, our show notes, and our show notes, I wonder if Margaret Atwood remembers, I wonder, we can tweet at her, and <laughs> find the Apple find guy, yeah. just the called Apple. <laughs> so thank you so much, dear readers, for joining us on the maiden voyage of the Time to Read podcast. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we have. Now I can officially, well, let's not me do it because I didn't practice the name. Who wants to officially uh, reveal the next book? I'll do it. All yeah, right. Go for it. Okay, so our pick for February is Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. Nice. <laughs> You nailed it. I nailed it, I think. You can write in and tell me if I pronounced that last name wrong. Opa. <laughs> Opa. Great. Uh, so you can find it at Winnipeg Public Library. Uh, uh, what's our website? <laughs> Not the podcast website, oh, the Winnipeg, library website. Winnipeg.ca slash library. Thank you. Uh, email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with any comments or constructive criticisms you have about the show. That's wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. Remember to rate us five stars on iTunes. Uh, and ne until next time, make sure you find time, time to read. read. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of Time to Read. We were discussing Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Your hosts today were Alan Chorney, Kirsten Werman, Trevor Lockhart, and Erica Ball. Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media maven is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. Some of our comments and questions today came from Aaron, Catherine, and Danielle. Some of our sound effects come from freesound.org. Please check our show notes for full credits. We want you to be part of the show, too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books you'd like us to read and discuss. You can also email us with your comments and questions about the book we're reading for our next show. Next month, we're reading Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. We're looking forward to hearing what you think. 